right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, I thank everyone for being here today. It is so fun to be a campus dietitian and to have so many different universities. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cara Miller, the dietitian, um, and I cover the greater Nashville area. Um, I just mentioned, but March is National Nutrition Month, so I thought, what better way or thing to focus on than plants? So the first talk I did was in January, um, and we got some good feedback from there. It was kind of getting back to basics, get rid of the fad diets. Last month was a little bit knowledge heavy, but good information about heart health and how to understand your numbers. And so just piggybacking right off of that, a great heart healthy diet is focusing on plants. If any of you have missed any of the sessions that I've done, um, I will make sure that I put the YouTube channel in the chat box towards the end of the session. But um, it is, if you just go to YouTube and you search dietitian Cara Miller, it will pop up. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to recommend to all of you is to check with your campus HR because I have worked with multiple universities over the last month to um, get this kind of session qualified for your benefits. So I know everyone has different benefits, each university that I cover, um, but I have spoken with Lee, Lipscomb, Belmont, um, Trebecca. So if you have a wellness group on campus that you can accumulate points for uh, through faculty and staff programming, or if you have insurance benefits, UT Martin was another one. So um, if any of those things pertain to you, make sure that you record this presentation, not record it, write it down that you took it, um, because I did work with them to approve it ahead of time. So I think that's a huge benefit. Tell all your colleagues um, we're going to run another session in April and all of these will qualify again. So it's a great easy way just to get a few points, learn a few fun facts, um, and hopefully it'll be interesting information as well. All right, so here we go. We're going to talk all about plants. Um, first, we're going to go through the benefits of plants, and then we're going to go through where to buy the different produce. So I know we're going to talk about plants. Might as well talk about where to buy it. Um, then we're going to talk about any tips and tricks for helping you process it. So I've got a few tips and tricks for the refrigerator, making things last, a few things on how to prep a little bit easier, and then we'll roll right into a few recipes. I want this to be a very user-friendly presentation today. Um, and then at the end, I will want you to think about a goal. Um, so as part of the wellness programs that I've been working with, uh, you're required to make a goal, um, write it down. It's part of your kind of wellness initiatives. So I do want you to be um, aware of that and we'll make a goal at the end and then we'll do some Q&A. So first off, um, health benefits. First thing I like to talk about is hydration, especially as we're rolling into the summer months. Hydration is key. It's really important that we stay well hydrated. And you say, Carl, why is that? I know I'm supposed to drink more water, but um, hunger and thirst are right next to each other in the brain. And so oftentimes we like eat something, we're like, yeah, that didn't quite do it. Let me try this. Oh, that didn't quite do it either. Let me try this. And our body is just trying to tell us like, Carl, you're thirsty, drink some water. But hydration can also be in the foods that we're eating and fruits and vegetables are packed with hydration. Um, they can also help with our metabolism, fueling us up well, even though they don't provide, um, water specifically doesn't provide calories, that hydration can help us to use our metabolism more efficiently and fruits and vegetables are just loaded with those. The next one is fiber. So um, with heart health, we just talked about, we know that blood pressure and cholesterol are affected by the amount of produce that we eat. And the more produce that we eat, the more healthy things, the more fiber, then the better our heart health is. And um, it can also help our gut health. So as we're looking to fuel our bodies with fruits and vegetables. We want our gut health to be good too because they've been showing more and more research with the gut-brain connection. So there's a lot of things going on there. We're still learning a lot, but especially when it comes to mood um, and even like seasonal depression, a lot of times our gut bacteria affect our mood. It can affect our anxiety levels. So eating um, a more rounded diet with extra plants can also help those. Um, it also helps us to feel full, which is always a good thing. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is when you eat more fiber, it's going to fill up your funnel. And I'm going to show you what that means in just a minute. But before we get there, we're going to talk about nutrients. And phytochemicals actually means plant chemicals. And what we find is the more phytochemicals you have, the more plants you have, the lower risk of cancer. And so that's a great thing to think about as we're trying to think about our health um, overall. We already talked about heart health, um, decreasing our risk for cancer. The other 
other thing is they're loaded with antioxidants. So that's going to decrease our inflammation. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about flu season. But the other side of it is as we get older, our joints might ache, um, arthritis, any of these things that cause more inflammation um, can cause us to have a harder time moving around. And so if we can incorporate more fruits and vegetables that can help with the antioxidants to decrease the inflammation, we actually might feel better as well. And then it's loaded with color, right? So every color has a different key nutrient, even thinking about like vitamin A and that little orange carrot there at the bottom, um, it's helping our eyesight. So getting a lot of different colors. When we say eat a rainbow, I really don't mean Skittles. I really mean looking at your fruits and vegetables, trying to get something that's red and orange and yellow and green and like our blueberries, our dark purple beets. All of those are great things and they all have a different key nutrient to focus on. Um, I mentioned the funnel effect, and if you hadn't joined me yet, if you're new, um, I did want to talk about it just for a minute. So I have this um, theory, kind of our stomach is like a giant funnel. It's filled with liquids. So if you think about putting food in milk or water, if it turns to mush, those kinds of things are going to slip through your funnel. So over here, we've got like crackers and pretzels, right? If you put cereal or crackers or pretzels in milk or water, they get mushy. And so they slip right through. And that's why we can frequently eat like a whole sleep of crackers and then be like, hmm, what's for dinner? Because it doesn't keep us full. What keeps us full is what stretches our stomach to tell our brain that we're full. That process takes about 15 minutes. So if you scarf down your meal, you may not have it. But if you're taking your time and you eat foods that don't turn to mush when they help milk or water, um, then it's gonna stretch your funnel and tell your brain that you're full. So if you're looking at this picture, we've got broccoli, bell peppers, carrots, tomatoes, all of those things. If you were to just throw them in a bowl of water, they would just sit there, right? So those kinds of things are gonna stretch our stomach and tell our brain that we're full. Amazing. It's wonderful. I had someone just the other day say, well, Cara, how many grapes should I be eating? And I thought, well, if you throw grapes in milk or water, they don't turn to mush. That's one of those things that you can just eat grapes until you're feeling full, as long as you don't scarf them down too quick. But that will tell your brain when you're full, as opposed to crackers. These are not things that you should avoid. They're not things that you can't have. It's just that you have to watch the portion sizes of them because your stomach is not going to. Um, so that's why you can eat a whole bunch of crackers and feel ready for dinner. So what should a plate look like? Balance. I am a firm believer that all foods are included. No foods are off limits. There are not good and bad foods, but we do have to try to find some kind of moderation and play into how we're feeling and um, our hunger cues and things like that. So you can see, but most plants are very colorful, full of fiber, full of nutrition, and they don't turn to mush. So all of these things are going to be a big benefit for us as we're looking for a balanced diet, um, big benefits from our fruits and vegetables. The other thing is seasonal eating also has benefits. So mm, did you know? When you look at the different seasons, we have some common problems or common things that tend to come up. So right now, if you're in the Nashville area, you see all the trees blooming. Today, the wind is going, maybe the rain will knock some of it off, but all these blossoms, everyone's allergies are just going crazy. So people are familiar with local honey. Um, local honey actually contains some of the pollen from some of the plants in the area. And what that does is it gives our body a chance to in include it in small ways so that it doesn't view it as a foreign invader and throw up all the defenses, which are inflammation. And you say inflammation, yes, I know, I'm sneezing, I got a cough, I got a tickle in my throat, my nose is stuffy, all of that is inflammation. Other things that can decrease inflammation are our fruits and vegetables. We just talked about all of those antioxidants, all those very colorful things. So when you're thinking about the spring vegetables, lots of dark leafy greens. We've got strawberries coming in season soon. Um, asparagus is another great spring vegetable. So all of these can help decrease the inflammation, which can help with your seasonal allergies. Um, another thing is summer. We have a lot of need for hydration and skin protection. So we've all probably heard of um, omega-3s or fish oils that decreases our inflammation. But the other thing are fruits and vegetables. Lots of vitamin C and vitamin E that can really help with skin protection. Um, vitamin C actually even helps us with our cells when they replicate. So it can build like a tougher barrier almost to help us with our skin protection. And it also adds lots of hydration. We talked about that. So a prime summer meal might be grilled fish with cantaloupe or something like that. 
Um, as we head into fall, it is flu season or this whole last year we've been in COVID season. So we wanna decrease the susceptibility of ourselves even taking in this virus and have anything that can act as an antiviral. So antioxidants, again, lots of fruits and vegetables help with that, um, but also some of our seasonal produce. So if we think about fall, we often think about apples and onions and garlic and all of these actually can help to decrease your viral load and your susceptibility to getting sick. As we head into winter, our four seasons, um, we may be familiar with low vitamin D and seasonal depression. Um, the low vitamin D can increase our blood pressure and our cholesterol, which ties into our heart health talk from last month. But if we're looking at the seasonal produce, we frequently think of potatoes and winter squash, those really creamy squash, not like our zucchini, um, but like the winter squash, your butternut and things like that. These are very high in potassium, which have a positive effect on heart health. They boost our energy and increase our fiber. So you you can see that eating seasonally also has health benefits there too. A couple other things I wanted to touch on are cost savings and they're eco-friendly. So I think there's a big misconception that eating healthy or eating more produce actually is more expensive. It can be if all the things that you buy go to waste, which I do think happens frequently and that's what we're going to talk about for the second half of the talk. But we've all filled up our grocery cart before where it's like half meat, half produce, and you get to the checkout line, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. Our meat products tend to be a lot more expensive than our produce. So if we can fill up more on produce, that definitely saves on our wallet. Um, you can buy canned and frozen options, which we'll talk about a little bit later in some of the practicality, but that does take down the cost a little bit. And then buying seasonally and looking at the end caps. So when you look at, um, like if you go into Kroger, some of the ends have fruits or vegetables that are about to be overripe. Don't be afraid to buy those if especially you like to freeze things or you like to make smoothies. Those can be a great way to save a little bit extra money, um, but you're still getting in that fresh produce. And then talking about eco-friendly, um, as we shop seasonally, we're supporting our local farmers, which I just think is wonderful. I grew up on a cattle farm in Wisconsin. Um, my folks both had working jobs as well, but it was a dairy farm converted to a beef cattle farm. So I very much appreciate the farm to table aspect and understanding where the food comes from and supporting local farmers. I think that is a really, really good thing that we need to do more of. Um, but the other thing is that shopping in season decreases the travel time. If we're buying things that come from California, just so we can get strawberries in the middle of winter, it has to travel all the way across the country to get to us. And that's a big footprint. We're putting off a lot of greenhouse gases that way. Um, the other thing is that um, animals produce more greenhouse gases and a larger footprint in general. So if we can gear our diets more towards plant-based, we are actually helping the ecosystem as well. I have just a couple statistics here. Um, greenhouse gases, 42% of them are produced by animals. So if we're changing more towards a plant-based diet, that can decrease our greenhouse gases. Um, the other one is that beef cattle use 20% more land than it than it takes to produce plants. So again, the footprint that we're using, the amount of times that a tractor has to go over soil and can cause erosion, there's a lot of different things that pertain um, to our eco-friendly um, boost by using plant-based diets. The other thing I can't help to mention, they're tasty, right? Everyone has their preferences. There are definitely different ways to prepare things. Um, I'm a firm believer in understand why you don't like something. Is it the texture? Is it the taste? Is it the noise that it makes when you chew it? <laughs> is it the flavor? Um, if something is mushy, we can always figure out different ways to prepare items if we know why you don't like what you like. And that's included with my kids too. So if you have children or grandchildren, ask them why they don't like something. Don't allow them to use it yet gross, try to figure out why it is they don't like it. Okay, so let's move on. Um, where should we buy this fresh produce? Um, we're going to talk about farmers markets and you pick locations and CSAs. If you don't know what those are, we're going to go into them. And then I will spend a little bit of time talking about grocery shopping. The one that I'm not going to touch much on today is growing your own, but I would encourage you to try it. I know even this weekend, I planted some things with my kiddos. We got some little trays from Ace Hardware, put the little pods in there, the little, um, the soil pods, and you can put the little um, seeds 
seeds in and they're already sprouting in just a couple of days. So it's really fun for kids to see as well and for us to understand where our, our food comes from. It doesn't come from the grocery store. It, it can grow on trees, <laughs> but we do want to make sure we know where our food is coming from. So let's get into some local shopping. I've pulled up a few websites here as well, so I'd like to show you those regardless of where you're from. I know I cover a wide range of Tennessee, so depending where you're joining from, um, I wanted to cover a couple different things where you would be able to look up items that would be local to you. The first one is farmers markets. Um, PickTennesseeProducts.org has great options. Your farmers markets are going to run May to October typically. Some of them may be June to September, just depends on your market area, but I'm going to hop over here to the Pick Tennessee products so you can see that. Um, I pulled up Davidson County here, you can see. If you just go to the website, it has all these and you can hover over it, Richland Park. You can click on it, it gives you the days and times, things like that. It'll give you a phone number, a Facebook page, any social media that they've got. So that's really handy if you're looking for something in your area. You can just type in your address or look it up by region and that's pretty slick way. The other thing that's up here, you can see seasonal up here, right here, farmers markets, and they have a pick your own as well. I'm going to talk about another website. Um, that has a tip, typically a few more options for your you pick, um, but this website does feature that as well. You pick as you go pick your own. So this is one of my favorite things to do. Get dirty, go out with your muck boots or whatever you need to do. Um, pick strawberries that are coming right up. Um, then we'll have our blueberries and blackberries. Down here in the south, we've got peaches. I grew up in Wisconsin, so I did not grow up going picking peaches. We picked apples, um, but still similar concept where you really are getting to go and pick your own. A few pick your owns um, would be there's a TNT in Ashland City. Green Door Gourmet is right here in Nashville. Um, Beatty's Berries I've picked at. They're wonderful down in Murfreesboro. And Kelly's Berries I also pick at out in Castle and Springs. So if you go up here, pick your own, pickyourown.org, um, you've got all kinds of things here. You can again click Tennessee. It's going to bring up all of the local options and it gives a little blurb about the farm and their contact information. And I just really encourage you to reach out to farmers. They're going to be really appreciative that you're even interested. They often have a lot of great tips and tricks. And that's one of the things that farmers markets that I always always tend to do is ask the farmers a lot of questions. They're the ones that grow it, so they have a lot of it. They usually know how to prepare it. So for example, when I first moved down to Nashville, um, I was very intimidated. Is by asking some of the local farmers. The last thing we'll touch on is CSA. If you haven't heard of that, it stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And you typically get a box or a peck, one of those big bushels or a peck, you get like a, a peck is a half of a bushel. So you've got a couple of bags of groceries, um, but a full bushel is a big box. So be aware that if you're getting that, you're gonna have a lot of produce. So one of the things I always recommend is know the price. Um, localharvest.org has great CSA recommendations and they typically do have the pricing on there as well. I didn't pull up that website, but I would encourage you to go there. Look at the price. They usually charge right away at the beginning of season and you have to sign up now, even if it doesn't start till May. So that's something to start looking into. Some of those boxes have already closed and they may not be accepting um, subscriptions kind of for this year anymore, but definitely look into it. Um, know the price and divide it by the number of weeks. You will find that most of them are about $20 a week, maybe $25 a week. But when you get two big size grocery bags, essentially filled with produce each week, that's a lot. Um, and I think that you will find it's worth the money if you're willing to spend the time preparing it. It does take prep. It does take cooking skills. So if you're not quite there yet, maybe just save that $20 and head over to the farmer's market and use your money that way. Um, but the other thing I recommend is sharing with a friend. Even for our college students, I recommend them sharing with a roommate. I did that in college. We would get a CSA box. We had four roommates. We'd split it between the four of us and it only ended up being like five or ten dollars a week. Very reasonable and that way we could all use the fresh produce. So check it out localharvest.org. Okay, into shopping tips. Make it last, save your money. Fruitsandveggies.org. So I do have this one up here. I'll click on that in just a minute, but I wanted to talk with you about buying fresh, frozen, and canned. I think people are often very intimidated by buying frozen. Oh, it's probably not as good when actually it's picked at peak 
freshness and frozen right on the spot. So it actually holds a lot of nutrition. And what you might find is that it's actually more healthy or have more nutrients than some of the fresh because the fresh has been broken down just over time. As it ripens, it tends to lose some of its color and freshness. So as long as you're getting things that aren't in heavy syrups or frozen with extra sugar, um, the frozen options can be wonderful. They usually don't have the added salt and things like that, which are great. Canned is also a great option. Again, I was speaking with someone this week about frozen bean, I'm sorry, canned beans. And the canned options, if you rinse them multiple times, it actually takes off around 50% of the sodium. So especially tying into last month with heart health, if you're watching your sodium intake, um, take those beans by the low sodium option to begin with, and then rinse them a few times. And that will take off about 50% more sodium, which is wonderful. Um, and don't be afraid to buy frozen. As I mentioned, one of the th best things that I like to buy frozen is chopped onion. Um, I don't always love to put on my kids um, swimming goggles just to chop up onions. I definitely tear up with those. And it is a little bit of a pain um, just having to cut them every single time. One thing you can do is prep them ahead of time, keep them in the fridge. We'll talk about that. But the other thing is to freeze them or buy them pre-chopped. You can just grab a handful, throw it in your fry pan, cooks right up. You don't have to thaw it before cooking. The other thing is frozen veggies. We're familiar now with the steamer bag of veggies, but if that tends to be a little bit more expensive and you're looking to save a buck, you can easily take a glass bowl, fill it with a little bit of water at the bottom, about an inch or so, put in your produce, put saran wrap over the top so it creates its own steam bag, and then just steam it for the same amount of time. You may have to give it one or two tosses, but in a few minutes, that broccoli or green beans are gonna be cooked just like the steamer bag, and it saves you a little bit of money. You can buy the generic store brand that you find in the store. Um, think about the week ahead. I mentioned that a lot of times when we waste our produce or it goes to waste, it goes bad, is when we waste our money. So if you can think about, for example, fruit over the course of a week, if you only buy berries, you're going to have to go to the store every few days. But if you think about it over the course of a week, Maybe you want to get berries for the first few days, then grab like a few bananas or a few grapes. Those are going to be better towards the middle of the week and then have a few apples or citrus so that you have something towards the end of the week. And that way you just buy a few of each and it will last you for the whole week. And then you kind of have a plan on how you're going to use it as well. I mentioned I was going to go over to this fruitsandveggies.org. This is a great website. Um, if you click on fruits and veggies, you can click on whatever fruit or vegetable you like. So if you are curious about a certain item and you don't know how to prepare it, this is a great way to learn about it so that you can um, pick it out appropriately, learn how to store it, and it also has a few recipes. So let's just click on asparagus. I mentioned that's a seasonal one. So you'll see here, you can select it, selection fresh, shows you how to pick it out, the nutrient and health claims, how to store it, and then how to serve it. Um, it gives you a few social media tags as well. That's the new thing nowadays. Um, but you can get a little bit more information, even talks about what the heck is white asparagus and purple asparagus. So it'll give you a nice information there. It also talks through avocados and things like that. So let's move on. Um, a few more tips, shop the sales. Um, this often means that they're seasonal. So you'll see now strawberries are less expensive than they were a month ago. And that's just because they are becoming more in season. Again, if you have something that's overripe, don't be afraid to freeze it. You can always use it in a smoothie or yogurt or even ice cream topping, right? Ice cream is my favorite. So always add in some fruit there and it makes it a little better for you. Um, think about multiple cuisines. So when you're planning your grocery list and you're looking at the produce that you have, frequently we look at a recipe and we go to the store and we just buy this and this and this and this to cross off what we need for the recipe. But we're not thinking about how we can use that produce in multiple ways. So then once that recipe is done, you may have extra and now you don't know how to use it and you're too, you know, you're too busy to just be looking at all kinds of recipes and then you don't have the other ingredients. So think ahead. One example is bell peppers. These are a lot of ways you can use bell peppers. You can make fajitas, you could do them chopped up in a pasta toss, you could always add them to a salad, cooked or fresh. You can add them into a stir fry um, and you could do a sheet pan dinner. You could always dice them up, put them in an omelet, or you could use them for a snack. And you realize here that if we look at this, almost all of these are sliced bell pepper. So when we're talking about how to prep things, 
it would use sliced bell pepper for the fajitas, maybe diced for the pasta toss, um, sliced for stir fry, sliced for sheet pan dinner, sliced for snacks. So if you slice them and then you decide, oh, I think I'm going to make an omelet, it's very easy to quick. Just take out your slices, dice, 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 and you're done without having to core it, wash it, core it, all of that, right? So it saves you a little bit of time as well to think ahead. So I just mentioned prepping your produce. You definitely want a cutting board, some Ziploc bags or airtight containers. I always use the Rachel Ray term, the garbage bowl, right? You go to grab a giant mixing bowl and whatever peelings you have or extra insides, like when you're pouring out the bell pepper, you can throw those right into the garbage bowl. Um, and then you definitely want your produce that has been washed and some towels or paper towels. Um, the one thing I'm gonna encourage you to is try a new place to prep your veggies or fruits. Um, I've found that a lot of people are like, Cara, I just can't stand in the kitchen and prep my stuff. It's just too boring. And I say, who told you you had to stand in the kitchen? So think about it in a little different ways. Maybe there's a different place you can do it. Like I said, first thing, wash your produce in the kitchen, then find a place you like. Maybe it's the living room coffee table. That's one of my favorites. The kids are running around and I can prep some stuff or the kitchen counter. Um, of course, you can stand in the kitchen counter. Maybe it's a dining room table. Again, you can have access to other people. You can see out the window. Maybe you want to prop up um, an iPad or have the TV on, watch it, your favorite Netflix show or whatever. Maybe you've got like a Tuesday night show you always watch. Well, why not spend 20 minutes of that prepping your produce and then you're done for the week. It can make it really easy and still enjoyable without being a big pain. Um, the other thing might be even an outdoor patio table. As the weather gets nicer, grab that table outside with a chair. Just pull yourself outside quick um, and just enjoy some fresh air as you're prepping your things. And don't forget to taste some. I always say that. Um, it's good to taste your produce nice and fresh so you get a good feel for what it is, what the texture is, how it is, um, and you can really gain an appreciation for it. I mentioned this, but listen to music or watch a show, sample your produce, take it in um, and enjoy the process. If it's cumbersome, just like if you were to set up a treadmill in front of a brick wall in your basement, um, you're probably not going to go down to your treadmill. Oh, with cabinets in front of you, you're probably never going to prep your produce. So make it enjoyable so that it doesn't feel like a pain. And again, you'll only have to do it once a week. Now let's go over a few ways to save you on some storage tips. So one of my favorites is to take your giant bag of greens and to put a piece of paper towel in it. What happens is we all then get these greens and within a couple days, they're all slimy and you're so frustrated and you're like, oh, it's so bad, you just throw it out. So if you think about just when you first get at home, whether it's a bag or um, one of these plastic containers here, wipe it out of paper towel so you get all the moisture out and then pack a piece of paper towel underneath. I'm like doing tongue twisters over here and then put one more on the top. What that does is it soaks up the moisture. When something gets slimy, the cells as they age are damaged and they break kind of like a water balloon. You've got a water balloon, it pops open and the water releases out and then that water hits the other cells. It's kind of a trickle down effect and then everybody starts popping, right? So over time, all of these cells that hold the lettuce nice and firm tend to get wilty and wet and slimy. So if you can keep it dry, that definitely saves you on your produce. And I've had lettuce like this last one to two weeks, um, not just a couple of days. So that'll definitely save you a little bit of time and money. Um, we talked about the onions, dice them up, put them in Ziploc bags, throw them in the freezer. That's really easy. Then you can just, again, they freeze individually. They're not going to freeze in a giant clump, especially if you put them kind of single layer in the, in the Ziploc bag. And that way you can just take them out and use them. We talked about slicing bell peppers. Um, here's a difference here. So bell peppers are one, again, where once they're sliced, you want to wash the outside, slice it up, core it out, dice it, or put it in slices, which I prefer because you can always dice, but once they're diced, you can't put them back into a slice. So they're harder to take to work as a snack. Put in one or two pieces of paper towel, and that really keeps it fresh because, again, it's so taking some of that moisture out. The opposite is true with carrots and celery. Actually, did this just did this. You know, you've no offense to Buffalo Wild Rings, right? But you've all been there. You get the to go box, you get the, the carrots, and you're like, 
oh, they're like hard as a rock. They're kind of white, all dried out, never good. Um, the same can happen in your own, you know, pantry drawer. So that's happened to me. We had these little carrot chips. Look for other cuts too. I would encourage you. So um, Kroger, for example, we get, they're called carrot chips and it's almost like a Lay's potato chip is the shape of it. It's a circle with like waves in it. Um, and it's a carrot. It's just carrot slices. Sliced carrots are just not the petite or whatever. Um, but they were getting a little dry. So I took a plastic container, put a little bit of water in it. So it just kind of cover them, put airtight on and make sure you tell everyone in your family, because if they start throwing around, it might get water all over. But that extra water definitely rehydrates your produce. So for celery and for carrots, you want to add water because those tend to dry out over time. Down in the bottom corner here, I have some fresh herbs. So these are wonderful. If you get fresh herbs going over the summer, what you can do is dice them up and you can put them either in oil or in water and put them in ice cube trays and freeze them. And then you can just put it in a Ziploc bag and keep it for as long as you want. I shouldn't say as long as you want. They will keep for multiple months though. Um, but for example, think about how you're going to use it. If you're going to use it in a soup in the future, you may want to do some in water because that water is just going to dissipate into your broth and you won't even know that it's there. Um, the olive oil is great for more like saute. So maybe you're going to do some kind of, you know, Asian dish where it's kind of a saute and you're needing the oil anyway, then that olive oil is a great option. You can use other oils as well, but olive oil or even an avocado oil, something that's liquid tends to work a little bit better. I do have the avocado pictures up here and I had a video for you guys. However, I cannot figure out how to share my sound. Teams did an update. I just checked it yesterday and it worked great. Um, and the button that I clicked yesterday is no longer there. So welcome to technology. I will show you though where I got it. So I would encourage you all to go over to my Instagram page. Um, it's at dietitian underscore Cara, K-A-R-A, -A, right here. Um, and if you scroll down just a little bit, I have this avocado video. I'm not going to share it for you today. I was going to. It's three minutes on how to pick out an avocado, but because the sound isn't working, it probably isn't worth that time. Um, I guess I could do a voiceover or something, um, but I'm just going to show you a few pictures. But I would encourage you, go ahead and go watch that video um, so you can learn how to pick out an avocado. But up here, you're going to see the gist of what I had. So when you pick out an avocado, you don't want it to be bright green or that really kind of green color. You do want it to be a little bit brown or the dark green color. What I want you to do is pop off the stem. If you pop off the stem and it's green inside, it typically means it's green on the inside. If you pop it off and it's brown on the inside, it's starting to oxidize on the inside. That doesn't mean it's going to make you sick. It just means that oxygen is starting to hit it. Those cells, like I talked about, are starting to break down and you're getting a little bit of that brown color, which can also affect the flavor. You're going to get more of a soapy flavor when you have that dark coloring as opposed to the real creamy, rich, almost sweet uh, flavor when you have a regular ripe avocado. Once it's cut and used, you do want to put it back together because again, we don't want that oxygen to hit it. So if you can keep the pit in, wrap it in saran wrap or plastic wrap that tends to keep it um, so that it doesn't get oxidized as quickly. If they're not ripe when you get them from the store, you can do just like you do with peaches. Put them in a paper bag, um, leave them on the counter for a couple of days. The chemicals there that they produce on their own will start to ripen each other. If it doesn't go in a day or two, you can put a banana in. That speeds up the process. And once they get to your kind of where you want them to be for ripeness, throw them in the refrigerator. That will stop the aging for at least a few days so that you have time to use them. You don't have to use five avocados just in one day. So hopefully that helps you with a few tips. Have any of you heard of pulses? You probably have heard of them, just maybe not the term. So I wanted to introduce you to that today if it's unfamiliar to you. Most of us have heard of the term beans and legumes, which I use also. So beans and legumes. Legumes are here, soybeans, peanuts, peas, fresh beans, as well as our pulses category. Um, dry beans, dry peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Pulses are from the legume family, but they are the dry edible seed. So even hummus is considered more of a pulse. Um, however, most of the time when we talk about pulses, we're talking about the dry seed that you rehydrate and can use in another way. The nutrition benefits is they are low in fat, very high in protein, and very high in fiber. So that is wonderful. They are also eco-friendly and very inexpensive. So if you're like me, I didn't, I, I think I grew up with them, right? Like my Nana would make pea soup and things like that, but I didn't pay a lot of attention. So I need a refresher. 
So I would encourage you to go to pulses.org. I'll click on it here. They have a lot of great recipes. Um, what are pulses? Quick meal ideas, but I love the cooking tips. So again, if you don't know where you're headed, you can click on the cooking tips and it will give you based on beans, chickpeas, lentils, dry peas. Um, it will show you how to soak them, how to use them. And then of course you've got the recipes there as well. So that's a very handy website, pulses.org. It's wonderful. They also put on great webinars if you're ever interested in learning more about pulses. Um, a few ways you could use pulses would be by black bean quesadilla. That doesn't mean that you have to eliminate all cheese, but this is a vegan option if you do eliminate the cheese. By doing black beans all kind of smushed up, it makes more of a puree and a really creamy texture. The other thing would be to consider hummus for breakfast. I think of hummus a lot of times for snacks or even on a deli sandwich, but um, lately it's been wonderful even on an egg sandwich for breakfast. Um, the other one here is a red lentil pasta. So some of these pastas you're gonna see more frequently than we've ever seen before. They typically are gluten-free and that's why they've been produced. Um, I often buy like a quinoa and rice uh, pasta for a whole grain option, but they also now have a lot of these pulses pasta, pulse pastas, um, like a red lentil pasta. And you can find those in the pasta aisle typically. Um, they might be a little bit more expensive than your wheat pasta, um, but not too expensive because again, those pulses aren't very expensive. So that should be a good cost saving for you. I just encourage you not to overcook it. They do tend to cook up really quickly. So if you leave them in the water as long as you would normally leave wheat pasta, they're going to be mushy. Oops, here we go. All right, on to a few meal ideas. This is one I love, sheet pan dinners. If you're the kind of person that says, Cara, if it's more than 15 to 20 minutes to make a recipe, I'm gonna throw in a frozen pizza, I am right there with you. We do the same thing at our house. So it has to be quick, it has to be easy, it has to be something you can easily make in one fry pan, like one big fry pan, or one sheet pan. So these are a few sheet pan recipe ideas. Harvest chicken with apples and sweet potato, balsamic chicken with veggies, chili lime salmon. You can see the list goes on, it's not limited to just to chicken. The trick here is to make sure that all of your produce is about the same size so that it cooks up at roughly the same time. The recipe I have for you is super healthy kids. I know it says kids in the recipe, but that also means it's going to be simple ingredients and easy to use and your kids will love it as well. This is the website, superhealthykids.com, and it breaks it out by category, which is really nice if you're just interested in looking for snacks or breakfast ideas. But you can also use the search tab, and I have pulled up sheet pan dinners. So if you click on 16 healthy sheet pan dinners, this is the one that has the most recipes all in one stop. So if we'll just click on it, it will load right up, and it gives you a picture as well as a link to the recipe. So this one is um, sheet pan chicken with spring veggies. Do you notice they use the aluminum foil? It's a quick cleaning tip, right? No one loves to scrub the fry pan or the cookie sheet. So put a sheet of aluminum foil, spray it with your Pam spray. You can even get the Pam olive oil. So you're getting those healthy oils. And then it's a very, very easy cleanup. Now, if it's just one or two of you at home, I do know that some of these recipes can look really big and daunting. Um, you can cut them in half or you can always freeze it. So remember, leftovers keep in the fridge for one or they will go in the freezer for three months. So just keep that in mind. You can always box up the rest and put them in the freezer. Here's a one pan kielbasa recipe, cashew chicken. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see here, there's a lot of great recipes here to do a one stop shop sheet pan dinner. Now, the thing that usually takes the longest is the meat. So if you want to marinate things over the weekend, you can. Um, one of the tips that I used even when I was in college was to take a gallon freezer bag and put different marinades in each one and then just cook them all on the same day on a cookie sheet that has like the rack on it. Then all the juices drip down and you then have like a salsa chicken, a balsamic chicken, a lemon pepper chicken. Um, you can come up with all kinds, maybe a teriyaki chicken. And that way you have them for different things that um, salsa the chicken you could use in a fajita or you could use it in a rice bowl to make like a burrito bowl or you could use it on a salad to make a southwest salad so you can use them then in multiple ways or if you're doing more of a sheet pan style you could again as long as it's a thin cut they will all cook at the same time so you just have to make sure that it's out of the freezer right because if you come home from work and the chicken's still in the freezer now you have to thaw it and then cut it and then put on the sheet pan now it is going to take you longer than 15 to 20 minutes got to plan ahead just a little bit 
Another one here is the slow cooker, using the slow cooker or different freezer meals. Um, the Instapot is really popular now as well, so you can use that. A lot of them have a conversion if you're going to do it in an Instapot instead of in a slow cooker or crock pot. Um, but again, Super Healthy Kids has a lot of great recipes for that. Um, and when I was even talking about those chickens you can marinate, I know it's off the topic of produce, but you can even make like a well. So like if you take um, a sheet of paper, right? You've got, I don't even know, I'll just rip it out. If you take a sheet of paper and you like make like two wells like this, like you could do with your aluminum foil. So take a sheet of aluminum foil, make like two wells like this, and then you can put like a fajita chicken breast in one and a teriyaki in the other, put the lid on, they all cook at the same time, but then it keeps the juices separate. And again, it's a really easy cleanup. So then you can do two chicken breasts at once or two flavored chicken breasts at once. And you've got them for the week because again, if we don't have the meat, that's often again, why we're searching for really easy things to prepare. The produce and the sides or the grain or the potato usually are not what take the longest. Okay, so remember, you do also have a lot of options on campus to make sure that you're getting in your fresh produce. I used this slide for the very first presentation I did, but I think it's worth coming back to. Um, the fresh produce that we use on campus, I pulled a few of my campuses and just pulled some numbers. So for example, in the dining hall, we use 190 backpacks full of broccoli every week. We use 18 giant industrial wheelbarrows full of fresh greens every week. If you take the weight of the amount of carrots that we use, it would equal the size of a giant panda just in one week. Um, for fresh produce, shout out to our women's um, Belmont basketball team for winning yesterday in NCAA. Let's talk about basketballs. Um, if you take one, the weight of 1,000 basketballs is equal to the amount of fresh produce that we use in one week, fruits and vegetables. If you're just looking at fruit, the fruit weight is equal to a baby grand piano. Um, so that's another one. Lots of fresh produce that we're using right here on campus. Um, and again, whole grains I know is not the produce category, but um, we use giant bags of rice. So if you put it down into like an Uncle Ben size of rice, the individual size rice, um, rice, farro, quinoa, all the whole grains, we would go through 900 of those mini bags each week. Tons of fresh produce, lots of whole grains. And if you're interested to see where they are and what they are, I would highly recommend you download the Bite app by Sodexo. It's right here, the B with the orange U, that's the one you want. And you're gonna search by location. So here I have Deacon Jones down at Lee University, but there's a lot of different universities. Everybody has it. Download the app and you can search the menu. When you click on the menu, you can click on the day and it will separate it by meal period, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Under that, you will find the different category headings. And so this is by station. So you know what's at each station. And here is the heart emblem. That's our wellness or mindful emblem. It shows a healthy option. VG stands So vegetarian here, vegetarian would include milk and eggs. So that's where you can see that. There is this button up at the top. If you have any food restrictions, you can um, search and let it notify you of milk, egg, all the top eight allergens. I do recommend though, don't self-navigate. If you have a major food allergy, please tell a member of our staff so we can prevent cross contact. But if it's a lactose intolerance or something, this can be really helpful to kind of know what might be in that product. If you're interested to learn more about our locations, maybe what's open now, um, menus are on the website as well. Meet the team. My information is on there if you need more information. And your campus bucks. Everybody has a different name for them. Bison Cash. Um, Bruin Bucks, things like that. You can type in the name of your school, .sodexomyway.com. You can pull up the website. Um, if you're doing it on your phone, you can pull up the website, hit this little save button at the bottom, and it'll save it to your home screen, which is super handy because I know a lot of um, faculty and staff members, when they get on campus in the morning, maybe you've forgotten to eat breakfast need to eat your breakfast. So click what's open now and it will guide you towards what's open now. Again, you can see the menu on there as well or get my contact information. So I told you that you were going to have to set a goal. So I'm just going to walk through a goal, but I do want you to take time to make a goal as well. We use the SMART method, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. 
One thing you will do this week, what would you do? I'm going to say I'm going to go to the grocery store. Um, you could also sign up for like an Instacart or something like that, um, a click list through Kroger. There's a lot of different grocery systems now that are offering a delivery or an order ahead and pick up, which is really nice because that keeps you on budget and you can really go through your life. Oh my goodness. You can go through the list without being tempted by the store aisles. Next, let's see, next week by getting my produce, I'm going to be able to prep it. So I'm going to prep my um, Netflix, oops, prep my produce while I'm watching my Netflix show. So by the end of the month, by prepping those items and doing my grocery shopping, I will be able to create at least two sheet pan dinners and I will prep my produce on Friday night for one month. So for four in a row, I'm going to make sure that I do it on a Friday night. We talked about a lot of different things today. Um, we talked about plants. They're healthy. Please eat them. Um, we talked about different ways to shop local, and I'm happy to give you those resources as well. I am going to post this, like I mentioned, on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you just search dietitian Kara Miller, K-A-R-A, -A, um, I do post the recording, but I also post links underneath it. So I will link to all of the information here um, as well. And let's see what else. Um, prep on the weekends, we talked about that. Easy meals, sheet pan dinners, crock pots, and we talked about our on-campus options. So I am going to let you, this open up for questions. Um, I see some people have written in the chat, and I'm so sorry I wasn't looking as I was going through. The slides will be available after the presentation. If you send me an email, I will be happy to send you my slides. I'm happy to do that. Will the recording be available? I just mentioned that. So the recording will be available if you go to um, YouTube Dietitian Cara Miller. It will be there. I'm also going to send it out to the HR groups that I've been in contact with, um, and I'll send it to the link. We have the next talk coming up April 27th. And so on April 27th, before that, I'll send out the invitation again, similar to how you got it this time. Um, and that way, I will also put on there the link to the YouTube channel. Slides would be great. I uh, could not see the video stream. Oh no, the screen froze. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me now and see the screen? I'm so sorry I didn't see that. I did not know that the that the screen froze. Shoot. Anyone else have any questions? Let's see. I can hear you, but the screen is still frozen. Oh, shoot. Okay, let's stop sharing here. Stop sharing. And I'll turn on my video. Should go. All right. We'll see if this works. I take it a different way. I'm sorry I didn't notice that the screen froze. Um, I didn't have an opportunity to fix that, so I apologize. I thank you for everyone who's hung on. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, question. What do you think about the plant-based burger options? That's an excellent question. Um, they are not all created equal. Um, I would definitely look at sodium content. Some of them can be very high um, and some of them have so many additives that they're actually more calories than the regular burgers. Um, I do like like a black bean burger, things like that. Um, the Impossible Burger is great. Different campuses are carrying those, so that's one you could ask about. Um, but I also know that a lot of our campuses are carrying a black bean burger. Um, some of the others that are not a black bean burger that are more just like a veggie burger tend to be a little more iffy to me. Um, but I, I think that the veggie burgers are a fine option, especially if you're trying to avoid beef. But typically, I would even tend towards a turkey burger. Um, but yes, some of those plant-based burgers are fine to use, but I would go towards more of a black bean burger than some of the mixed veggie burgers. Some of them are actually more sweet potato. Um, so it's almost like putting a French fry in between your bun, um, and that can not be exactly what you're looking for. So definitely take a look at that. Uh, a question about mushrooms. 
this is a great question. Um, how do you store mushrooms the best? So mushrooms are one of those that if you start washing them or if you rinse them right when you get home, it immediately starts to break them down. They tend to be very spongy, so they can they can hold a lot of moisture, and they do. They get really kind of slimy pretty quickly. Um, so there, too, that's another one where it needs room to breathe. So if you put it in an airtight container that's too small, it is going to get mushy more quickly. Um, if you can, put it in a paper, like the box that it comes in. Sometimes you'll get like a little paper box or something like that. Or if you can just put it in a bigger airtight container that put paper towel on the top, paper towel on the bottom, anything that takes out some of that um, moisture is definitely going to help. Other questions? All right. Um, if you need anything, um, type my email down here, car.miller at sodexo.com. Feel free to shoot me um, a message. And do you, do you have good uses for kale? Kale is one of those that is tricky to work with. Um, it tends to be very strong flavored and the texture, it's a very tough um, green. So a lot of times they say like to massage it, you wanna make sure that you really break it down a little bit so it's easier to use. I personally like to use kale in soups. Um, I know a lot of people like a kale salad and that's wonderful. That's not what, how I love it, but if you do like it that way, by all means, um, a lot of people are doing kale chips also but sometimes you know they just don't keep for very long they're a really fun one to have um, but they don't often last for very long so if you want to do do a few on a cookie sheet with a little spray and a little salt um, or seasonings that could be nice to cook them up that way um, but typically I like to use them in a soup or something that's cooked suggestions for hitting veggies for kids. I have kids. I can completely appreciate this. <laughs> Anything you can chop up super tiny helps a lot. Um, but the other thing is making sure that they understand fruits and vegetables as they get older. So there is a time, like you mentioned even now, right? You can make a smoothie and kind of hide some stuff in there. You can chop up veggies really fine and put them in a pasta sauce or put them in a stir fry. They usually don't pick them up that way. But again, kind of looking at why don't they like the vegetables and why are we trying to hide them can give us an idea. If they don't like a mushy, then we got to kind of take a look at that. Um, but one of the things um, that I like to do is even just put them on a plate and have the kids try them. And again, it can take a little bit of patience and experimenting, but um, getting them to know that it's not scary. It's not something that... Uh, that they should be afraid of. I don't have a rule like you must eat five because you're five um, and that's okay. But sometimes it can be more fear-based and they don't feel like they have an out. Um, so if you can take a plate and put two or three things on it that they love and put one thing that's unfamiliar or a new vegetable, they will be willing to try it. Um, unfortunately, the research does show that it can often take 14 to 16 times of exposing a kid to a vegetable for them to eat it. <laughs> and that doesn't even mean that they're going to love it. So I do think it takes exposure. The other thing that I really also love is getting kids in the kitchen. So if you have the opportunity as they get older, I don't know the ages, but um, as they get older, can they help you prep stuff? Can they help you slice stuff? Um, can they help you wash vegetables? I know my daughter loves to peel carrots and wash potatoes. Um, and then also getting them involved with the gardening process, getting them excited about seeing stuff come up and what it looks like coming off the vine that can help too. I do know that it's time consuming. Um, and I do think that there is a place for hiding some of those vegetables in there as well. Um, the other thing I mentioned too, is they do have a lot of different pastas and noodles and things like that now that have some veggies in them as well. But just keep in mind that, for example, like a spinach wrap really doesn't have a lot of spinach in it. Um, if you think about how much green it takes to dye a smoothie green, it doesn't take much spinach to dye it green. So that's true even with that big wrap. Um, if you just put a tiny bit of spinach, it's going to make the whole thing green. And oh, yeah, I'm eating a spinach wrap, but it's really just not a lot of spinach. Um, so trying to get them to eat some of the other things is really good, too. Um, do you have a list of vegetables that can be vacuum sealed? I don't have that list. That's an excellent question. I don't have a vacuum sealer, so I actually have, I, I don't know that answer, um, but I'm happy to look it up for you. Um, Marsha, if you don't mind sending me an email with that question, I would be happy to look it up for you. And if I can't find anything quickly, I do have a lot of resources for other dietitians that I can reach out to, and I'm sure one of them will have a good example as well. 
Other questions? These are wonderful. All right, um, I am going to sign off. I will post this video. I'm hoping that the video recording worked, um, that the slides showed up on the video recording. We will see. Um, but hopefully that worked out so that I can post it and everything will be great. Please look for the invitation for April. And if you don't get one in the next, let's see, probably at least a week before, I'll be sending it out. So if it's a couple of days before and you haven't gotten that invitation, feel free to send me an email. Um, and I'm happy to forward you the invitation just, you know, personally, but I believe it actually is the same website link. Um, but if you have trouble getting on, please send me an email prior to, and I'm happy to send you that information, and I will be posting the recording later today so that you can view it there as well. Um, thank you guys for all attending. I thank you for your time, and if you have questions about campus nutrition, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm a resource for you as well as the students on campus, um, and I love working with all of you, so please don't be a stranger, and I look forward to seeing you again next month. Take care.